Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where today I am going to be sharing with you an interview that I did with the man, the myth, the legend, Matthew Buckley Smith of poetic fame and Slee Ricketts fame. In fact, he has been placed in a movement, and not one from the bowel, one that will be a Wikipedia entry. And it's not even on this fucking episode, because I had to break this fucking thing up. So apologies. But first, let's get to the motherfucking shout out. So, right off the bat, I want to give a big thank you to my folks over on Patreon. Michael, Deborah, Cedar, Harry, thank you guys so much. You guys are fucking awesome. And then I want to give a big thank you to those who are like helping support me on the YouTubes. I want to give a thank you to Alan, to AM, and to Patrick. You guys are the fucking shit. And now I want to drop them down, pull it out, and swing it over my head. The big swinging dicks from the Anarchy Crew. And that is Bunny, thank you, Nate, Mindy, Thomas, Tim, Lisa, Josh, Jessica, Shaylin, Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin. You're new. Thank you. And I want to give a big fucking thank you to the number one chappy over there, the SDG. Thank you so much. You guys are fucking awesome, and I fucking love all of you with all of my heart. And I hope again that you are getting from me everything that your heart desires, okay? So thank you guys for that. Now, if you want to be that badass, all you have to do, and do it from your desktop or your laptop, because honestly, doing it from your phone is kind of wonky, and um, as you may or may not know, I had some problems trying to figure it out. But if you go over to my YouTube page, and if you don't know how to get there, go to IHateMattWall.com, click the YouTube icon on the top right. It will take you to my page, and on that page, on the right hand, right hand, top right hand side, you will see the join button. If you don't see the join button, it might be because you're not subscribed to me. So just fucking subscribe to me and then click the fucking join button. Then you will be given the opportunity to join the crew so you can see video versions of this podcast and extra videos I do. You could join the Anarchy crew, which gives you... Get ready for it because it's going to be a fucking laundry list here. Daily writing prompts. Discounts on my merchandise. Weekly live streams, over a hundred videos of lessons and workshops, plus you get access to the Anarchy Crew Discord server, and your work that you do gets put into the Anarchy Crew Anthologies. Volume 3, as I've been saying for way too fucking long, is right around the fucking corner. And there's other shit too you get from that, plus the you get to participate in the monthly projects like Project Broadside. I finally got everyone's broadsides. That's going to be coming here really soon, too. So that's going to be fucking awesome. Can't wait to get that out and more on that in the weeks to come. And, um, yeah, so you get all that shit. But if you want to be even a bigger swinging dick, swinging for the fences and knocking the balls over the walls, you could join the chapbook of the motherfucking month club and be a chappy and get in on that. And then you get all that shit I already talked about. Plus, you get my chapbooks sent to you every time they come out. So like this month, you're gonna be getting MacArthur Park, my new chapbook. It'll be out probably by, no, actually it'll be out Sunday. I should not have even shown that to you guys. Motherfucker. With all this said, all the people on Patreon, all the people in the crew, all the people in the Anarchy crew, and SDG over in the chat book of the month club, I just want to fucking say again, thank you. Now, some of you may be wondering, 
How can I be that cool? Well, there's a way, there's a way, there's a way. So this is how this is gonna go. We're gonna play a game right now. I want you guys to get out a piece of paper, get out a fucking pen, and I want you to make a mark every time I say something that you have done. And when you, when we're all done, you add up those points, and then you'll find out how badass you are. So first off, are you subscribed to me on YouTube? If you are, give yourself a point. Second, have you subscribed to my mailing list so you could get the 2021 yearbook for free before the end of the year? Have you joined on Patreon? Give yourself a point if you have. Are you already in the crew, the Anarchy Crew, or the Chapbook of the Month Club? Give yourself a fucking point. Have you reviewed and rated this podcast on iTunes? If you have, give yourself a point. Have you shared any of these videos to other people on YouTube? Give yourself a point. Have you told any of your friends or family out there that they should be not only sub to me on YouTube and not only following my website, but subscribe to this podcast. Have you done that? If you have, give yourself a fucking point. Have you been picking up my chat books on Etsy? Give yourself a point. Have you been buying my books on Amazon? Give yourself a point. Are you following me as an artist wherever you stream music? Give yourself a point. If you have a bunch of points, you're a big swinging dick and you're fucking awesome. If you have half of those points, try harder. If you don't have any of these points, what the fuck are you listening to this for? Jesus fucking Christ. Shit or get off the pot, man. Fuck. Yeah, so that's how we do things here. We don't fuck around, dude. Life is too short. You fucking go and you go hard. You fucking type hard. You fucking do the thing hard. And you do it all the fucking time. That's what I'm talking about. Ooh, the popo is rolling. I wonder if it's because those guys got into a fight outside earlier today. Anyway, so um, another little update I want to give here is that I didn't realize this, but there's only 10 episodes available at a time on the iTunes on the iTunes stream. And that's because of something I fucked up on my website. I didn't realize this thing. So I went in and I fixed it. And now all the episodes are up. Even um, an episode from back when I was in the desert, when I was first going to do this podcast, and then I fucking life happened and I decided to wait. But all the episodes from Big Bear, where I'm reading poetry and playing my guitar and singing and all this other shit, all that stuff, all of the political rants, all that shit. So if you've been listening to this podcast on iTunes and wondering why the fucking um, archive starts at like 22 and then next week it starts at 23 and so on and so forth, now you can go back and if you really want to subject yourself to all that shit, you could listen to all of it. You could listen to... The whole me trying to fucking do the crowdfunding thing for fingering the mundane. You could hear all of it. So on today's episode, me and Bucks are going to talk about haircuts, San Francisco, YouTube versus BookTube, critics are dying, Rotten Tomatoes, favorite movies that everybody hates, Mumblecore, Mumblecore, Easy Come, Easy Go, The End of Everything, Threat and Poetry, Franz Wright, Carl Phillips and Stamina, The Cockroach Theory, Why Artists Need to Live Life, Should a Poet Live an Interesting Life, Oscar Wilde, Sylvia Plath, and we kind of end it with a Hayden Garth poem called Graves that Bucks so graciously reads for us. And we didn't even get into the meat of what me and him talked about, so that is to come. So without any further poo here is my talk with Bucks. Because this is fucking gold. Yeah, I don't fucking know. Um, uh, but, but yeah, well, uh, <laughs> good, good luck. You'll you bring your bring some flowers to your guy. And, and uh, oh, dude. LA, where is he? Where is your guy? Dude, no, I'm in LA. The guy I like is in San You're Francisco. In 
So I'm <laughs> I'm trying to weasel my way into someone else's trip to San Francisco so I can just get my fucking haircut. I oh. have never I think I went once as a kid, but it was like a stopover, so I don't yeah, I don't know it at all. Yeah, like but I've heard I've heard very good and very bad things about it. I didn't yeah, see I anything all true in different ways. I didn't see anything bad. Like there was like the bad part of town and I didn't realize it was the bad part of town because it doesn't look anything like the bad part of town here. So I was just like, doo, 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 right. doo, 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 doo. but um, the only thing that I don't like about San Francisco is that the fucking uh, doorways are so fucking narrow that I crash into the door jam every fucking room I walk into. And that drives me fucking crazy. So um, that's the is only thing that Is there a San Francisco sucks. style? Is there an architectural... Yeah, everything everything's built narrow that's... and up. It's just like, it's like this. So like doorways, like you would probably, like even though you would probably fit, you would probably hate it because you're from like the South and like Victorian fucking manners right. and fucking wide ass fucking doorways that you could drive fucking two wheelchairs through at any fucking given time, you know? Um, not the fucking case, dude. Like it's, it was tricky. It was tricky getting around. I'm not gonna fucking lie. God, Godspeed. I hope it's a good trip. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. How's um, how's how's life there? How's you were you were really prolific. I mean, you're you're like insanely prolific with your writing, but you're also prolific with your, like, sh- I I can't even figure out like you have the podcast, but then you also do YouTube videos like pretty steadily, and I don't even know what that whole culture or rhythm is like i don't yeah even just like the kind of like watching the kind of video you put out with the tag thing like the original tag thing yeah yeah i yeah. think i get the idea now but like there's just a whole there's a whole uh, uh jargon and etiquette that's just alien to me it just depends on what part of youtube you're in because there's like whatever like fucking niche you're a part of there is a blank tube for that that has right. that comes with all of its own little fucking things. And when I first got on YouTube with this, it was just a booktube channel, which was basically me reviewing books, me buying a bunch of books and showing what I bought and um, having discussions right. about like books. My, da- my daughters watch videos of like girls opening toys. And it, it's exactly. Like a version of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Book halls, mail halls, that kind of shit. Uh, that's my that's my strategy. So you're I want to talk to you because you sent me a long, angry, uh, somewhat coherent thing about um, somewhat coherent. The other day. It was I think I basically follow. Uh, but um, but I don't like but also it sounds like you were pretty comfortable stepping into the role of critic. Right. I mean, unless like unless you talk about all that you were you were talking about all but, the books you. But that's the thing. Bought. Every everyone's a critic now. Like critics had a purpose before the internet, before any person could say what they thought about something. So now in this yeah. world, there is absolutely no need for a critic. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't generally d- disagree. I mean, I think like you're right. There's tons of criticism. There's an overabundance of criticism, uh, but I also think like there are people whose recommendations I take more seriously than others, right? And like, to me, that like that was what we were talking about when I think Cameron brought up Helen Vendler and Harold Bloom, neither of yeah. whom I'm a, an enormous fan of. But like, I, I know enough of their work to know that like, if they take something seriously, it's at least worth a look. Yeah. Um, and to me, like, that's, that's the only real authority that matters for criticism. Like, that someone is the critic for X publication or Y publication means fuck all. But like that, that person has said things in the past that seemed smart. That's the authority. That's all I care about, right? Or I mean, the and the other the other version of that is like if you have written things that I admire, and then there are things you like. Often I will, I will at least, uh, I will give that a little more weight than I might otherwise. Well, here here's two things I will say about that. Um, Gene Siskel, you know, mm-hmm. are you familiar with him? The Siskel and Ebert movie reviews I guy his from his daughter a little bit. Yeah, I don't. I I know who he is. But yeah. Okay, like legend film critic and sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they were Chicago Sun Times, but like they were like all across the country. Okay, he yeah, yeah, yeah. made a movie in the seventies 
called Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, which I love because it's a trashy piece of shit. But it just okay. goes to show you someone who's sitting here talking about what film should be and all this shit made a fucking piece of garbage fucking movie that nobody oh, likes. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And no, like the absolutely. Whole, absolutely. And, and I'm sure like th- there's tons of examples of this with critics who write books that are absolute garbage. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think that you're, I mean, in fairness, I think like Godard was a critic before he became a, a, a director and Tarantino was a, I mean, if you want to call him a critic, he was like a, he was like the guys who wrote the comic strip in Athens and worked at the video yeah. store. He was like that guy. Um, well, I and, just and think that critics reason. are, that critics, especially pre-internet, were social mm-hmm. influencers. Like, they were influencers. They were, they were social, it was the same thing as like a social influencer on Instagram now. They were the only ones yeah. that had a platform that was like, hey, listen to me. This is what I think is cool. Like it. Yeah. This is what I yeah. think sucks. I mean, Hate it. Sure. And and that having they're having a stranglehold on that doesn't doesn't do anybody a whole lot of good. Uh I I do think that there's like there's some there's some differences between that and influencers for a few reasons. But but beyond that, I think like again, the question is is not like does the fact that you are a professor of X or that you have a job at Y publication, like, does that give you authority? Or does the fact that like you write in an interesting way about movies and I like reading what you write about them. And then it, sometimes it affects how I, what I choose to go, go see and and then think about. Okay. Well, I understand what you're saying for you, but how would you say the majority of a population reacts to a critic's critique? I mean, does the majority of the population read criticism? If they were to, like the right, people yeah. who actually do, how many of yeah. them are? Because, like, when you guys talk about like, Bloom I think the majority shit, are. Yeah, are you yeah. guys? Are you and, guys and like predisposed? Like yeah. Totally, but are you guys predisposed to like something that he liked because of who he is, or do you want to actually like? Do you not make any decision no. until you go through every single thing I mean, he says? Oh yeah, I mean no, I definitely don't don't follow all of his thought. I mean no, I, I, he's written so much. <laughs> I yeah. definitely have read only a tiny part of it. But no, I, I think like uh, I am. First of all, he writes mostly about things that are already very well known. But no, like mm-hmm. I, I think what 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 to me the the authority of a critic like that is if he reads something and he says this is really good. And it's something that I otherwise had been inclined to dismiss. Mm-hmm. Then I will give it a second thought. Then I'll say like, all oh, right. maybe I missed something, right? That's about all. But like, if he loves something I already know and hate, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to defer to him. Um, yeah. You know. But do you think there I are think, people out there like, who just go, oh, Bloom likes this, so I must like it too. So at my next dinner party, I can sound intelligent when I talk. I think much more common now is exactly what is the is the rotten tomato syndrome, which is mm-hmm. you don't even read the reviews at all. You just see the rating, which is the sum of positive reviews yeah, or the pr- proportion of positive reviews, which I think is just like star well, ratings on a podcast. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like well, nigh useless. Well, nigh useless. Like, I mean, it's truly like <laughs> star, yeah, oh, like star ratings on the podcast are, I mean, all a star rating, like a star rating on a podcast has exactly the same value as a letter of recommendation, which is just like somebody gave enough of a shit to bother to like click the button. That's all it means. Someone gave enough of a shit to like write a form letter and put your name in it. Um, I just, I feel like, I feel like we're in, I feel like we're in this weird little time period that will never happen again, where until all of the old guard dies off. All of these things will still exist, but all of these new things will, are also existing. And there will come a time when the old guard's gone and the Rotten Tomato Syndrome is just going to take over and there will be no more yeah, criticism yeah, yeah. the way there is. Yeah, I mean, that does not sound appealing to me either, though. I mean, that like that I think I'm glad at least that Rotten Tomatoes offers 
like a critical percentage versus a, an audience percent like that that and the yeah. difference you see sometimes is really telling for real yeah. but it's not all that it's not all that encouraging to me because i think i think like very often um like if if i am curious about a movie often i will look to the one star reviews because because like a lot of movies i love most people hate but mm -hmm. like if i can tell what you hate about it or why you hate it or what you didn't respond to that often can give me an indication of like oh well maybe there is something to find here so what's your favorite movie that everybody hates um my favorite movie that everybody hates I mean, I've talked about it on the podcast a ton, but I'm thinking of ending things. Uh, I, I don't know that everybody hates it, but I know a lot of people hate it. I love um, two of Gaspar Noe's movies. Uh, I love in Enter the Void and Climax. I hate Love, which I think everybody else also hated, and I think they were correct, too. Um, I, I, like, like, I also like plenty of like movies that are celebrated classics but that like most people like I, i've made the mistake of trying to put on movies at um at parties that were not party movies like mm -hmm. soccer you know um i'll say like my favorite movie that is like truly very dear to my heart that nobody has heard of um is uh toto the hero um, wow. great it's i think it's i can't remember if it's belgian or french canadian but it's some french language country but uh amazing amazing movie uh light incest <laughs> but um and uh and, well, and a little French bit of magical movie. reels and other stuff but, yeah right yeah but uh that's yeah that's that was one that did not go over well when i when i showed it to a group of drunken baltimoreans um so were I, you I were you went to mumblecore at all mm, um i some so i don't i also don't know what counts as mumblecore well like uh, upstream color shit like that what upstream color what oh upstream color is fucking brilliant yeah it's pretty upstream good yeah. amazing yeah oh no i mean that's a great movie i like that and that was one that i think like i think well, my brother was the only other person i know who's seen it what did you did you have an opinion did you think of it has something i've heard that yeah, guy is a I, real jerk as a person. i really I, I really dug that movie um and then his movie before that i think it was uh primer primer and that was okay. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't have the same thing for me. But the idea of mumblecore being something where there is a script, but the script isn't as important as the visuals. So, like, the volume on the sure. dialogue is so down, and, like, the um, low end of the soundtrack is right. up so high that you can't really hear. To me, it's just like, make a silent movie. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah what's the point of going through all of these processes just to do this thing? I don't even think it's a thing anymore. It probably came and went I as thought, quick you know, as crunk. I don't know. Mumblecore. Well, I think, I think what also <laughs> happens is Mumblecore because at least some of the Mumblecore figures were the Duplass brothers and Joe Swanberg and they all got, they got successful and they like make stuff for Netflix now. So I think like that's part of what happened to it. Um, which is like good. I mean, God bless them. Good for them. <laughs> Uh, Joe Swanberg's had some decent. I mean, a lot of those movies, I feel about them the way I feel about like Wham City in Baltimore, or like some beat poetry, or um, uh, it seems like it seems like some of the stuff that you and your scene are into, which is like it's made relatively quickly on a low budget, and there's not, and then it's sort of easy come, easy go. Like I can find yeah. it moving, I can be, I can find it touching, I can connect with it. Uh, I may not take the time to really chew on it as a unified whole but also like they're on to something new so why should what you like no no worries yeah i mean that's kind of the feeling i get when i read that's kind of the feeling i get when like i read your book uh the end of everything today and i, I had that feeling there's un, i'll see you write a lot about a lot of quotidian quotidian stuff but unlike plenty of poems unlike most poems i read i never got the feeling that like the stakes were low like the, it was like hyper intense and like 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 there was great angst and like risk and like i had a teacher used to say where's the threat 
And there's definitely well, there's a sense of threat everywhere, in Gibraltar. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a sense of threat in Gibraltar. Like there, it, you all, it also is does feel very much like you're like you're typing as fast as you can and then moving on to the next page as fast as you can. Um, so I think you know, which I think is like yeah. that's part of the. Well, there's especially in that experience. book, especially in that book, there's a lot of like kind of stream of consciousness shit. Just me trying to yeah. get through my. Um, trying to process my emotions of the things that are happening you know yeah. do you know uh franz right at all i don't think so the name franz, sounds familiar you know but it, yeah so J james Wright. so franz Wright was john james Wright's son um mm. he was i heard you yeah, talking about it on a show before yeah 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 the probably angriest human being i've ever met but he um was homeless for a while he was addicted to heroin he was in in and out of various criminal situations uh but published a number of books of poems while he was alive he died of cancer eventually um but uh his poems have that um that desperate edge to them that they're in some ways like they can be easy to make fun of but mm -hmm. they're he doesn't hold anything back. He lets it like he really does just spill all his blood on the page. And yeah. sometimes it can be too much. Like sometimes I find his stuff like, okay, man, just calm down a little bit. Like give us a clearer thought. But, um, but he's never, he never fails to take it seriously, which is something I do feel like a lot of so many poems I read. I just feel like you didn't, you don't care enough about this shit, man. Like, why are you publishing this? Mm-hmm. I hear that. Yeah, so, I'll take yeah. a look at that. Um, yeah, he's he's uh, his book that won the Pulitzer is called "Walking to Martha's Vineyard," which is probably his most uplifting book. <laughs> um, they get the his last book, I think, was called "Kinder Totenwald," which is means the the forest of dead children. Um, uh, but I think you might even like his earlier book, "The Before Life," uh, better. Yeah, he's, he would be worth a look. Yeah. So I went through your question. What did I also, there was something else I, I saw that you had that I wanted to, oh, you didn't ever figure out what that Carl Phillips thing was, did you? Oh, yeah, yeah, Okay, the whole thing that him saying stamina is the thing. Like, it's not yeah, yeah, what yeah. you make, oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, 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 yeah. stamina. Mm -hmm. And like, that's like, yeah. no shit. Like, it's like the cockroach theory, you know, like, cockroaches were here yes. before us they'll be here after us because they fucking persevere that's just what they fucking do so if you're in a band yes. no, no, and, or yeah, I, yeah 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 and no, so I've i was just like wow he's getting he, yeah he's getting like backpats and applause for fucking stating the obvious it's like what kind of an excerpt that was because it, i mean that is a very that's something one hears all the time i typically hear it the thing that was slightly new about the way he said it was was that he was not saying that stamina is more is a more important contributor to success than talent. He was saying it's a more important contributor to quality, which I think I still am not convinced of. I don't think so. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't really think so. I, I mean, I think that you you do need drive which i think there are like there are lazy talented writers right? mm -hmm. who never quite push or focus themselves enough to do what they are capable of yeah uh, so i think that that is like that is necessary but i don't know yeah but it's certainly not enough on its own yeah yeah, um, yeah I, was, I was just curious yeah. the other thing about that i was going to say about what he said was what you were saying how um you wish more poets thought like this where he was saying, I don't know how to keep things new and fresh. And um, I'll find myself using the, the same metaphors or the same lines or the same words. And I just toss that shit out, you know? Mm -hmm. And like my argument for that is because, and this will go into what we're going to talk about, about the poetry questions. Sure, but yeah, like, yeah. if you are in the same place, experiencing the same things over and over again for your entire life the poetry you write is going to also be the same in the same place with the same things all the time because there is no difference and i think a, 
a poet to be um, someone who can constantly evolve and change has to in their life continually evolve and change where they are, the people they're around, the things they do, the things they see, the things they observe. Like there has to be new shit all the time or else the things you will write will constantly fall in to the same things that they were before. Yeah. Yeah. So, th and this is, this is one of the, one of the questions was, was, does a poet have to live an interesting life? Is that post phrase? Something yeah. Like that? And I think the word interesting isn't a good word. I think it should be, um, I don't know, maybe just, just fucking live. Should a poet fucking live life? <laughs> like, should that be that? I wonder if that would be a better way of describing it, but yeah. Yeah. I, no, I, and, and I, I do agree with you that there, it is very easy to become stale as a poet and as, but like also just as a person, I mean, I think like, exactly whatever, whatever you do, however you like it, it's helpful to, to introduce new challenges, to take up new problems, to, you know, to experience new things. Yeah, sure. Like, sure. That's, that's definitely helpful. I do. I do more or less stand by Oscar Wilde's observation, which I'm not going to get verbatim, but he basically said the most interesting poets he knew wrote the most boring poems and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, that like, if you were, that there are, and I think like a, a, maybe a more compassionate way of thinking about that is that there is such a thing as creating a persona. Yeah. Right? Like, which he certainly, I mean, he did to the hilt. Like, there's such a thing as investing your creativity in presenting this, this creature exactly. to the world. And that can exactly. be, a, a, that can be awesome. That can be a lot of fun for people to experience. But that is, but sometimes that happens at the expense of other work. Exactly. And, and, and vice versa. And I think, like, people can make too much of, like, I think there is some value to a little bit of persona. There's some value to a little bit of stage presence or a little, like at least the ability to read your fucking stuff audibly. But, uh, but yeah, I just think they're sort of, they're separate things just as with criticism and, and, uh, you know, creative writing, like they're, they can coexist, but they're just, they just are, you just have to be good at both of them separately. Well, like how, how famous do you think Sylvia Plath would still be if she didn't take a header in the oven? Way less. Yeah, less famous. So the suicide, her death was the interesting thing in her life. No, her poems are also interesting. But true, but there's a lot of interesting poems from a hundred years ago or fifty years ago or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Oh yeah, no, no. I mean, I think she would be way less famous. But I think yeah, it was a convergence of factors too because she she was married to one of the most famous poets in the English speaking world at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I mean, still like a, a, a really strong poet uh, who was also, I mean, they like, they were a kind of a photogenic, I mean, she was certainly very photogenic and died young as well. And died mm -hmm. and like, and died like immediately after finishing her best book. So yeah. like, I mean, a lot, a lot worked out there to, to create an enduring legend. This is sort of the feeling I have about, um, do you know the uh, Hayden Kreth poem Graves? No. This is this is I feel very much the way he he does in this book um, or in this poem about about bios about like poets bios about like me like me I, for a long time I didn't ever get uh, autographs like I didn't get books signed when I was around a poet with the, and I had the book because it just seemed like well, what's the fucking point and I and I do now the, the reason the reason I do I realized that you should do that is that it's not for you it's for them yeah because it's a really nice thing for somebody to come up to you and say like hey I I know I, this is a book I own and you wrote it and I would love for you to sign it like that's that's what it's for but I don't like I I don't expect to gain more from the life than I gain from the work so this is this is uh, Hayden Croth, um, who's a fucking weirdo. I mean, I love him, and he's very, he's super prolific, and also uh, had enormous range, but just a real weird guy. Uh, Both of us had been close to Joel, and at Joel's death, my friend had gone to the wake and the memorial service, and more recently, he had visited Joel's grave, there at the back of the grassy cemetery among the trees, a quiet, gentle place. He said, befitting Joel, and I said. What's the point of going to look at graves? I went into one of my celebrated tirades. 
People go to look at the grave of Keats or Hart Crane. They go traveling just to do it. What a waste of time. What do they find there? Hell, I wouldn't go look at the grave of Shakespeare if it was just down the street. I wouldn't look at... And I stopped. I was about to say the grave of God until I realized I'm looking at it all the time. Uh, but I think like just that that sentiment about like I I don't I have I, you know I found her poems moving especially earlier in life and and I I go back to them sometimes but like yeah I don't I don't know I don't it just doesn't hold like her life her bio doesn't hold that much interest for me and the same goes for, for real like I mean like Lowell and Bishop letters and that like they they're both poets I really admire and I definitely still read them today but like I don't. I don't know. It just doesn't seem that interesting. Like, I'm not, when I asked that question, it wasn't in the sense of, do you need to know about their life as much as it is? Does, do they need to live an interesting life in order to write poetry that you would like? Yeah. No, yeah, no. But I I think it needs to be, I think it needs to be interesting to them. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't need to be interesting to the outside world, and and generally, if if it is extremely interesting to the outside world, then then probably the the focus is in the wrong place. I hear that. There you go, everyone. That is it. That's all you get. That's all the bucks you get right now. So now you have zero bucks. Zero bucks for you. We're gonna go into the what is your poetry tag. Um, for those of you on YouTube, know what I'm talking about. And that'll be on the next version of this. Um, so on Wednesday, I'll post that. And when I was looking at how much time was left, like I might have to break that one up too. Like I w- wasn't sure if this was going to be a two parter or a three parter. But fucking hell, it might be a three fucking parter. So um, I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out here. And as far as the butt plugs go, I'm not even going to do the butt plugs today because I tricked you and butt plugged you in the front bef- when this whole thing started. I, I I did it in your front butt. Okay? So, yeah. So, that's fucking weird and gross. So, the only thing I'm going to say to you guys is keep buying my books, type hard, and I will talk to you later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.